Should be good. All right, here you go, Mo. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. All right, I appreciate everyone being here. My name is Maurice Crandall, or you call me Mo. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a professor of history at ASU. Um, and I'm a, a lifelong skateboarder and um, also a member of the Avapai Apache Nation, which is, if anyone came here on I-17, you get to the Camp Verde exit and there's a big casino there. That's our casino, Cliff Castle. So go and gamble there and spend money. Because <laughs> it might, a little bit of it might make its way to me eventually. Um, tiny bit. Although it paid for my education. I got a PhD with no debt thanks to tribal scholarships. So. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so today the panel is your skating on native land and I had some conversations with Ryan uh, a while back when he, he was already well into this and um, but thinking about ways to kind of kick this off in the right way and um, so, th so the purpose of this is to let everybody know that wherever you are whatever you're doing if you're in the Western Hemisphere and also uh, many other parts of the world that that you are on indigenous land, that you are on land that belongs to tribal nations and peoples who have a history of, of living there and, and um, since, as we say, since time immemorial, so even before we can remember. Um, and so the idea is to start things off that way, especially in a place like Phoenix, which if you haven't been here before, if you don't have a lot of experience, this is a really indigenous uh, city, an indigenous area. Uh, sometimes I, when I'm teaching my students, <clears throat> a lot of them are from Phoenix and from the area. And I, I ask them, do you know why if you go um, kind of to the east and, and get to Chandler, do you know why the city stops, essentially? At a certain point, the you know kind of buildings and the sprawl ends, and then it's seemingly sort of unoccupied space, or there's a lot of open, kind of open rangeland. And I ask a lot of my students, do you know why that is? And almost nobody knows. And then I say, well, that's because there are Indian nations right there, right within Phoenix. And so like Gila River, Salt River, I mean, we have uh, Fort McDowell, we have numerous um, indigenous communities right here in the Phoenix Valley, and most people don't realize that um, because they're sort of hidden within plain sight. Uh, they might only know of, of the casinos and sort of like the entertainment side of that. But you are literally on indigenous land. You're, you're on native land. When you skate around the valley, you're on native land. Um, and this panel is a reminder of that. In particular, in, in Phoenix, you are on Autumn and Peeposh land, which is Pima Maricopa communities. If you go a little bit east of here, you're on um, Yavapai land. And if you go beyond anywhere in Arizona, you're going to be on Apache, Yavapai, Wallapai, Havasupai, no matter where you go, you're going to be on indigenous land. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, uh, to serve sort of as a, as a reminder to that, but then also to um, hopefully expose some of you who aren't familiar that there's a, there's a long-standing, thriving indigenous skate scene that has been around for a long time. And um, I personally, I'm not going to claim that I've been involved deeply in that for a long time. I've always been a skateboarder. Um, but these are the people who have. And, and so that's why I asked all of them to be part of this. They are sort of the, the godfathers and mothers, the god people of uh, indigenous skateboarding. And so I'm going to rely heavily on them for their knowledge. So that's kind of the, the idea behind all of this. And I hope that uh, you learn something new. And I hope that you go away with this with a, a respect for um, the indigenous people and lands that you're, that you're on. Um, so I have a set of questions, and I'm going to just kind of go through this. Uh, first, actually, I want everyone to, all of our panelists, to briefly introduce themselves. Take a, a brief you know, minute or two and tell us who you are, and we'll, just kinda, we'll start over here and work our way back this way. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Tynesha. I am born for two who came to water in Mountain Cove. I am a Diné skater from New Mexico. <laughs> What's up, everyone? My name is Trey Polk. I'm from San Carlos, skateboarder, business owner. Uh, currently reside in Tempe now. Uh, Milav local now. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Jeremy Todicini. I'm from Gallup, New Mexico, from the Navajo Nation tribe. And thank you guys for having me here. And I 
this year is going to be 20 years of skateboarding for me. So thank you guys. Hello. Uh, my name is Cecily, and I'll introduce myself in Navajo. Yat e she Cecily Todachini yenshe kiaani yenshe tobaha bashin, and I am enrolled with the Navajo Nation, and I am from Smith Lake, New Mexico, which is off the grid and not in a city. <laughs> And I've been skating for over 13 years, and I don't know what I would would have would be without skateboarding. Thank you. Check. Hello, everybody. My name is Douglas Miles Jr. I'm from San Carlos, Arizona. I currently live in White River, Arizona. That's over in Sholo, uh, in the White Mountains. I am a professional skateboarder, a filmmaker, and a business owner. Hey everybody, thank you guys, everybody being here, it's really awesome. Thank you, shout out Ryan for putting this together. Thank you Ryan, he's skate after school, woo woo. New but, uh, uh, oh, New Balance and, and ASU, thank you both. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but uh, my name is Ruben Ringlero, I am Akimil Atom Pima from the Hill River Tribe, which is just south of here. Uh, where South Mountain is, our tribe is just on the other side, so basically, you're kind of on autumn land right now. Um, that's the land that you're on. Uh, the land of the Huacan people, we lived and built off of canals. There's a big canal system that we built many, many years ago, which is now from, which is our local communities use uh, the canal systems today. But uh, it's pretty cool. If you walk around, you'll see the old canals. You might even see pottery on the ground things like that, uh, just if you take a walk. I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, I've been skating for a long time with Doug and uh, just been a part of Apache forever and just love skating and supporting, especially on the res, you know, uh, keeping kids going out there. So thank you guys for being here. I appreciate it. Yeah, I want to uh, thank Ryan and ASU, of course, and uh, New Balance also for inviting us to be a part of this. This is, an, uh, I feel it's an important gathering. I think uh, some of the smartest and most innovative people are here uh, to be with us this morning. I think, and it's only smart and innovative people that really are interested in what we're about to say. I am the originator and founder of uh, Apache Skateboards, uh, which we've been doing this for uh, over 20 years, of course, with Doug and inspired by Doug Jr., of course, because I could not afford a name brand skateboard. So I made one for him from a blank skateboard and that's how it started. I didn't have enough money um, for the $55, $60 skateboard. And it's funny if you think about it, now you look back, skateboard prices have gone up, but not that much. But I bought them a blank one and that's how it started. And I also created the phrase, you're skateboarding on native land or you're skating on native land as a reminder, uh, because I've, I've for, all the, you know, for all these years I've watched brands come into our barrios, come into our reservations, leave, come into the neighborhoods and leave and not really offer anything except a couple of stickers or some product. And I thought, wow, it's like, uh, I felt like somebody needs to be reminded that you're on native land, but also if you come to our neighborhoods, you come to our reservations, you know, we're inviting you. Anybody here that's been to San Carlos, you know that we fed you. We fed you stew, we fed you bread, we had you a place to stay. So we took care of the people that came, but I always felt like sometimes some brands, they don't really think about how can we really, really help these communities. That's what I was thinking, besides just throwing out product, you know, letting kids fight over this product. So that's really where I believe skateboarding has to go next is Let's build communities. It's cool to be a dope skater, but it's cooler to be a dope skater working in a community. All right, panel's over. We're just going to go from that one. <laughs> you actually anticipated a lot of my questions, so sh shit. What am I do? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, actually, I, I uh, so I'm a, I'm an, I would call myself an ethno-historian, so I'm interested in pr 
uh, people's narratives and where they where they come from and sort of their backstory. And I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but I am interested in how each of you got sparked on skateboarding. Like, what what started you to be interested in skateboarding? Uh, was there anything specific, or can you remember like a a time or a thing or a person that initially got you interested in skating? So, and anyone can answer this. Okay, cool. oh, all right, so um, it was a source of transportation. I just wanted to get to point B without walking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got to give credit to my older brother because like, he's the one that really set things off with skateboarding. But on top of that, too, in the little neighborhood where I grew up, there's always been skateboarding around. And there used to be like this really old spot where we used to skate. And that's where everything started because, like, just seeing so many different, like, native skateboarders around that were older than me, you know, it really sparked me. And just to this day, I still feel that spark. So, like, I still feel very blessed to just to be getting older but still loving skateboarding the way I did when I was young. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it was on Christmas one morning. <laughs> all my cousins, uh, they woke up and uh, they all got pretty good, like, legit-sized skateboards. And I was the youngest, and I ended up with a little cheap plastic board, plastic wheels. And that kind of, like, pissed me off, you know, <laughs> as a little kid. So from there, they all stopped skating one by one, and I just took all their boards. And I kept <laughs> on going. I kept on going, then eventually got a pro board and whatnot. And that's how it started. Well, uh, for me, I guess, you know, growing up in the res, there's nothing else to do but either get drunk, party, go tagging, uh, just cause trouble. And uh, one of my friends picked up a skateboard, and they just started doing it, so we just kind of gravitated towards it, just not wanting to do what all my other friends were doing, you know, and, and most of them. A lot of them are kind of either passed away or they're in jail now, you know, and, and I owe it to skateboarding to keeping me away from that stuff. Just going out and skating, like, hey, you want to go get high? I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to go skate. Hey, you want to go spray paint? No, I'm going to go skate or, you know, I'm going to go do this. And just growing up through that, just keeping me motivated and, and keeping me doing something positive, you know, and uh, I wouldn't have thought it would have led me to here, you know, today doing this. And so I'm very, it's very humbling, you know, to be able to say that growing up through that and, and to just be here today. So it's cool. Uh, yeah, so the way I got into skating was all my friends in sixth grade, they were all skaters. And they would, they would sit in class, and all they would do was, was talk about skating, but I never skated. So I w there would be a disconnect uh, between me and my friends. I couldn't talk to them, but I wanted to. So one day I just got up, and I was like, yo, I'm going to start skating with everybody. And this was around the time when, like, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, like, the game came out. And I was already playing that. So that kind of sparked me. And I just wanted to hang out with my friends, to be honest, and, and be able to talk with them. So that's how I started. All righty. Mine is kind of a little deep. A little, yeah. yeah. And um, I guess I went through a traumatic experience of losing somebody I loved. They committed suicide in front of me. So... From there, I started going down like a downward spiral. And like, like Ruben said on the res, it's so easy to get drunk and smoke. And I didn't really want to do that. So I got a summer job at, a, at um, what we call a chapter house. It's like a little area where um, it's like a little meeting area provided for the reservation. And there they help uh, provide jobs for the youth, indigenous youth. So that's how I, I started trying to get my mind on something else and I seen somebody skateboarding and I tried his board and when I got paid that day my sister took me to the nearest town which is about 45 minutes from where I lived and I bought my first uh, zero pre-made complete <laughs> with monster trucks <laughs> and that's like the first board I ever got got a kickflip on and the funny thing is or the cool thing is that being at this panel is a uh, seeing Chad Tim Tim here because when I first seen a, a skate video it was a 411 that my cousin brought me and I seen Chad Tim Tim's part and seen how he was doing lines and 
uh, skating ledges pretty fast. That was pretty inspiring, and that's how I always wanted, like, that's what I had in my mind to try to do and just skate and get my mind off of that. And landing my first kickflip definitely rewired my brain to, like, hey, you could, it's okay, everything's okay. You, you fall, you keep going, and you can land stuff. And, like, just like that rewiring when you land a kickflip, you can't believe it. Like, you thought something was impossible, but it's possible. And I guess that's kind of helped me help me get out of that depression state like like it's possible to move on and to get out of that that's that's how I found my love for skateboarding and I've been doing it ever since and the passion just grew into creating a page a skateboarding page to get friends together and it blossomed into advocating for a skate park and coming together and helping design a skate park and working with the Tony Hawk Foundation and it blossomed into um, uh, f being a founder of a skate shop, which is now the first Navajo owned skate shop in on the Navajo Nation. Hell yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Doug, did you skate when you were young? I did. Uh, he's, he's trying to tell, get me to say how old I am. <laughs> uh, I'm not, I mean, you can see I have a little gray hair, you know, try to cut it short to kind of hide it, but. But when I was a kid, there was a, um, one of my best friends, he had this uh, wooden skateboard. This will tell you how old I am. And it had these red clay wheels on it. And then he, I said, let me try that. And so I was riding around on his skateboard. Then I went to my mom the next day. I said, Ma, Steve is from California. He has this cool thing. Can you get me one? So she got me one just like Steve's, which was wood and had red clay wheels. And when you hit a rock, it would fly off onto the street, right? But as time went on, we, we got better skateboards with uh, urethane wheels. This tells you how old I am. But we would sit behind 7-Eleven and buy these uh, skateboard magazines, and we would just look at them and like all afternoon and be like, wow, this looks pretty cool. Where are these people at? And then, of course, you know, you grow up and you move on to BMX and all this stuff and girls, and you, know, you kind of grow out of it. Some people do. So when, when Doug, my son, started getting into it, I, I remembered it. I remembered I was like, Oh, that was pretty fun. I haven't done it in a long time, but so whatever he, you know, if you're a parent and you have kids, whatever they want, if it's skateboarding, get it for them. Yeah. Whatever they want, I don't care. I, I couldn't always afford it, and for Doug, but whatever he wanted, he he'd show me. Sometimes I don't know where he got these little books. It was a little book. It said CCS on the top. <laughs> And, and we lived on the res, so he said, Dad, I, I, need, I want this. And I'd look at the book, and I was like, oh, this has like thousands of things in here. And so, but whatever he wanted, I tried to get it for him. So if you're a parent and you have kids that enter it, get them whatever they want. Because as he got older, <laughs> I don't know where he was at when he got older, but when he was younger, I always knew where he was at. You know? But <laughs> later on, you know, I didn't know where he was at. <laughs> I remember studying CCS catalogs. I had them, um, or those few pages like in Thrasher that had the mail order, and I'd like circle the stuff I wanted yeah. that I could never afford. I mean, it was like I wanted new what deal, about, big sorry. deal jeans that were like. What about active? Bucks. Remember active? Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Um, so did did you all grow up consuming skate media? Like what? Did you look at Thrasher or you, like web page type stuff? I mean, I, I'm like a generation before most. I mean, we're probably the same generation, but I watched. Thrasher in the library. <laughs> in the library? Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. I checked out, uh, I think, Future Primitive from the Smith's supermarket video rental place. They had VHS, and they'd have like three skate videos. It's like a couple Pal Peralta videos and maybe like Speed Freaks or something that you could rent. The first video I watched was um, Kaleidoscope because our um, gal I didn't know where to get a skate video, right. so I went to or my my grandma she used to go, she goes to church and at the Bible store I guess they had that Kaleidoscope Kaleidoscope DVD. Okay, that's when I my first skate DVD and it yeah. had Cat Tindem in it too. <laughs> okay. We gotta get these two together. <laughs> Stay. What about ever, what was the first skate video you can remember? Anybody guilty. Yeah, it was Shorty, Shorty, guilty. Yeah. Guilty. Yeah, real. Guilty went, then it was like uh, all the logics. The logics oh, yeah, were really yeah. good. Yeah. I have a Fulfill the Dream t shirt. I have a Shorty's t shirt at home, still in my closet. Ty, do you remember your first video? Um, no, actually. Yeah. I just right. 
Why? <laughs> um, I don't remember the first part, but I remember the first skate movie, and it was Lords of Dogtown. And ever since then, that's just been my Bible to skating. <laughs> nice. Awesome. I think uh, maybe like the Birdhouse video or like the four on ones. Um, you know, it was like a trip uh, just to go. We got to go to Caltown to, you know, my dad would bring me from the res and we get to go to Caltown and go buy a 411. You know, it was like Christmas every time we, we got yeah. to go and get one. And, sure. And I didn't get them all the time, but when we had them, you know, it was like that and chomp on this, you know, yeah, yeah, those right. kind of things growing up with that. Uh, the crazy birdhouse video with the uh, ladies in the lingerie and stuff being young seeing that i was like okay this is pretty wild but but uh, I, I won't show my dad this video <laughs> but uh, it was it was very very hyped on it stuff so. uh my first video was probably I think it was a, it had to be like a zero video, like thrill of it all. Um, Jamie Thomas, everybody was talking about Jamie Thomas in, in, in high school or school, like middle school. They're like, Jamie Thomas this, Jamie Thomas that. Like, Who's this guy? Like, uh, they're like, you got to watch this. Check this video out. And it was like a, a VHS, like black cover or something. And it was like thrill of it all. Like, here, you got to watch this. Check this out. Watched it. And I thought it was great. I thought it was good. Um, but yeah, I just remember how stoked everybody was about Jamie Thomas at this time. <laughs> Jamie Thomas, yeah. And then, um, but my favorite video at that time growing up was always Yeah Right. So when Yeah Right came out, then I was like, I kind of connected more to that type of skating. And when I saw it, I was like, wow, this is really cool. Like, this is the kind of stuff like I like to do and, and how I like the vibe to feel, you know? Uh, and of course, I, I loved Eric Costin's part, P-Rod's part. So those were some of my favorite videos. And I, and I always uh, looked at Thrasher magazine, so I'd always look at Thrasher, I'd always read the articles, I'd always look at the photos and then read the little captions they have, uh, like the kickflip or whatever. And I think over time, for some reason, like, I learned how to do that. So like when I started my Instagram, I would, like, I would remember all of these little captions and I'd be able to write really good captions and people would be like, wow, you write really good captions, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> But it would come from those looking at all those Thrasher magazines so all the freaking time. Um, but probably another one that sticks in mind is is the Sorry uh, series, like Sorry One and Sorry Two. Um, what was it called Sorry? Really Sorry or Really Sorry? Really sorry? Extremely yeah, sorry. Extremely Sorry was sick. I really, really like Apple Yard and uh, Arto was like my favorite uh, part in both of them. You know, he skated the Bowie, I think, in, in one of them, the first one, and then the Smiths in the second one. And the, I, I really like that second one where he's skating to the Smiths in the second one. Um, I, I don't know why, I just really like that part. Like, kind of even better than the first one. Yeah. But yeah. When, when you all were starting to consume skateboard media like that, when you saw videos and looking at magazines, did you ever think, uh, did you ever look for native people? Were you ever like, oh, are there native skaters? Or if you saw something, I mean, I can't, I can't remember. So I started skating in the 80s. I mean, my first board was a action sport kamikaze from Cost Plus, which is like Cost Costco. Was that Pri no Price Club? Price Club. That's what it was. Um, but I can't remember seeing a native skater in a magazine or in a video. Did anybody? Was, did you ever notice that, or was that a conscious wondered. thought? I always wondered. Yeah. What did you, What did you think? What, um, I just didn't think there was any, I guess, or there was no um, support, I guess. Right. Because I knew, like, there was skateboarders, like, within my area, like, that are native, but, like, I just didn't think that it was open that much to Native Americans within the industry. Sure. Anybody else have thoughts on that? When I was younger, it never crossed my mind. But until I got older, I was like, you know, wondering why, like, people, like, you know, the homies like us aren't, you know, getting the shine like some of the other people are. So, like, not until I got older, I was like, you know, people around me, people like some of my homies, are, they're good. 
but I don't know why none of the homies don't get any of the shine. And, like, that goes for all, like, Native people, too, because, like, there's a lot of really good Native skaters, but, like, I just don't know why they don't get the shine. Uh, and I'm not trying to rip anyone specifically, but I, d I did a search of Thrasher, um, just like rudiment, it's not like I did deep research or anything, but I found two Native American related articles in, in the searchable history of Thrasher. One was, one was about Jeff Ament from Pearl Jam building uh, skate parks on reservations, and then the other one was on Joe Buffalo, the Canadian Cree skater, and like, but it was recent, his kind of coming back around story and the, the trauma that he went through and how skateboarding kind of brought him out of that. Um, but you just don't, you don't find a lot of native skateboarding within the kind of mainstream media. And so, and it gets me thinking, is it, is that a worthwhile goal? I mean, should, should native skaters aspire to kind of be part of a mainstream media or should they just sort of forget it and do their own thing? I mean, what, I think it's think? inspiring, like especially seeing like Joe Buffalo, that's definitely inspiring and it like makes me feel proud to be indigenous, even though he's from a different nation, but it's just just seeing that representation matters. Sure. Okay, representation matters. So we I don't did anyone else look for people who are sort of like maybe not necessarily native but brown, you know, like I, I liked um I liked Ray Barbie. I liked uh, Tommy G. I like people who were a little more relatable. Um, Chico, yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, yeah, Chad, we need Chad to. Chad Tim Tim. <laughs> <laughs> <Again>. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so sh shifting gears a little bit, um, the idea came up about uh, building a scene, which is sort of like a, a hip phrase that you see in a lot of skateboard media right now. It's like we got to build a scene, and we got. And I think a lot of people do genuinely try to build scenes, but collectively here you have people who have literally built scenes. Um, so I want to hear a little bit about that, Jeremy and Cecily. Why did you want to open a skate park or a skate shop? Well, in the beginning, like in Gallup, because it's a small town and. There was really n not that much of a big skate scene, so we um, created a Facebook page called Enchantment Skateboarding. And from there, we would, uh, one of the goals is to share what spots we're skating, share some skate clips that we filmed with friends, pictures, a uh, little contest, DIY bills. And, and that's how we started like getting friends together and starting to meet up, skate street spots, build DIY spots, and um, from there, uh, we seen a uh, in the in the newspaper the city had put up like that they wanted to get uh, some skateboarders into a city meeting to see if it's if it's worth to build a new skate park. So me, Jeremy, his brothers, and a few of our other friends, we uh, attended the the city council meeting. Ty was there too, and. Um, we spoke about how we feel about getting a new skate park and how it would make a big difference for our community and around the whole area. And from there, they they agreed and we started to do plannings and uh, hosting events for Arts Crawl and trying to raise money to be a part of uh, a part of everything. So that's how it started blooming from there and it started to just slowly, slowly uh, become what it was and sure. yeah. When I, when I created Apache Skateboards, I wasn't really thinking, like, to go with, with what Mo was saying. I wasn't, we weren't really thinking about a scene, quote unquote, it was just doing something that was fun for kids and that had art that would reflect our culture. Because I was seeing a lot of, like, pan pseudo Native American graphics, and you still see it sometimes not as much in the skate industry. I've seen a lot of, like, kind of cheesy Native American graphics throughout the years in the skateboard industry and uh, and then I would look at it and I'd be like hmm I wonder if that guy's native so I just felt like well we might as well do it ourselves cuz it's it's kind of like one thing to like complain about it but it's another thing to like just make it yourself and then from there you know we're talking to you now but I wasn't like we weren't I wasn't trying to make a scene I was just trying to 
because I was looking at all those artists and I was looking at all those graphics and I was looking at like like Ed Templeton boards and Mark Gonzalez boards and I was like, dang, these these guys are good artists. And I was like, I could, I could do that. We could do that and we could represent a community and we could represent the Apache people and we could represent the tribe. And whatever it became after that, it just became that. I don't know how, I don't, I don't know how that happened other than when you do something long enough, you know, it just, people start to notice, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna put Ty on the spot. <clears throat> you, you mentioned to me yesterday that you want to start at some point in the future building spots on Navajo Nation? Yeah. So, so tell me about that. So right now I currently live in Phoenix because I'm working with construction workers and we build skate parks. So right now I'm working on Solano Skate Park. Um, it's a lot of fun. Day one, <laughs> lots of sun. I've never worked like that and <laughs> I did a lot and I learned a lot actually. In the beginning it was work harder not smarter because I didn't know what I was doing and these guys just kind of assumed I knew what to do, but I'm on week two and now it's work smarter, not harder. <laughs> so I love this new knowledge that I found, these new techniques that I've came across. So during um, the pandemic, a lot of skate parks were closed down and I believe a couple of them are still closed down. Um, it made me really upset how a lot of people didn't have skate parks open or they couldn't go to a skate park. And if you tried to skate it, they would take your board or they'd call the cops or something absurd like that. So what I'm doing now is I'm gaining this new knowledge to build skate parks, I guess, DIYs. I want to bombard the reservation with DIYs so kids have something to skate. That's awesome. Ruben, you start. You, you have a company, right? Uh, yeah, uh, so being a part of Apache uh, for so long, uh, there's Apaches in San Carlos, and then we have Hill River, the tribe I'm from, and uh, we just started Seven Layer Army, and our idea was to have skate contests for the kids in the community, and when they sign up, they get a skateboard. You know, they automatically they're kind of. It's kind of like a participation award, but we, it's the idea of just giving kids free product, you know, and just keeping them stoked on skating. And uh, we do about maybe four or five contests a year uh, out in the res. And we have three skate parks spread out throughout the community. And so we go to each skate park and have a contest. And, and it's mainly for the kids in the community. And so then when they sign up, you know, they get a shirt or they get a board or they get uh, product that we get from um, like real they donate a lot of stuff which is awesome thank you Jim uh, hooking it up and they, they support us all the time Jim Jim's awesome and um, that's kind of I guess the scene that we like to do is just keep kids motivated you know it's kind of weird because I thought about it, I was like well when you're in the city street skateboarding is that's skateboarding right you know but for us, the res, we have skate parks, and that's what we that's what we rely on, which is kind of the opposite. And um, but like during the pandemic, they were closed, and we had our first event last year because uh, they started slowly opening up the skate parks again. And when we had the the event, the kids were like, "I stopped skating because the parks were closed. I I I, I haven't been skating for a while because the park was closed. I didn't have anywhere to go, and so." That motivates me to keep having these contests, you know, like, okay, well, let's have these contests to give these kids prizes and keep them skating, you know, and I didn't have that growing up. I didn't, we didn't have skate parks, and um, now that I'm older, I wish they had them when I was younger, but 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 that's the idea, is just to, to keep these kids motivated, so hopefully, whatever they have to go through at home, you know, the, the drunkenness and the, the fighting and all that, that spark and skateboarding is what will what will keep them motivated. So that's that's kind of what we what I do today, and um, it's a lot of fun, you know. And it's never have to call it work, you know. It's it's a, it's a lot of fun for sure. Trey, I'm gonna. <clears throat> this is totally now. I'm shifting gears again completely. Uh, we don't. I mean, I don't know you super well or anything, but I I lurk your Instagram a lot because it's interesting. You got a lot of interesting posts. Uh, you own your own business, right? Are you, are you a business owner? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I own like a 
company that I just started. It's like all moving and all that stuff, like, you know, the nine to five kind of thing. But I also have a clothing line. It's called Oddity Skate Apparel. But that's kind of like underground heavy. Signature wax as well. Don't you have a signature wax? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I have a signature wax out there. It's from a company called Sea Wax Skateboarding out based out in Texas. All right. And that was okay. like really random how that happened though. So <laughs> how did the, uh, talking about random, how did the Gucci thing happen? What's behind that? Which one? Any of it. <laughs> tell, tell us all about Gucci and your connection. <laughs> all right, so all that Louis Vuitton stuff, all that happened through the stock market. I got into the stock market one day and uh, I just started studying it really hard, like the way I do skateboarding, and I kind of mastered it. And in like one day, I won't tell you guys how much I cashed out, but I ended up in Vegas after <laughs> <laughs> like one morning I went to work. The, in the nighttime, I was in Vegas. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's a bunch of random stuff that you can like master if you put your mind to it. Just answer it. Okay. <laughs> Good enough. Um, where are we on time? Okay, we got a little bit of time still. Um, I'm curious where you see anyone here, where you see Native American skateboarding going in five or ten or twenty years. I mean, none of us can really forecast, but where where do you see it going? Doug, you? No, I I just wanted to t- go back to a question before. Sure where you asked about representation in skateboarding in the industry where there is no Native American skateboarding pros, right, in the mainstream skateboard industry. I don't know why. I, there is none. Look around. There is none. Now, well, it's important for representation, but I just wanted to make the comment that that Cecily, I've, I've, I've been watching Cecily skate for a long time, and this was before um, um, anybody that wasn't male was getting shine, right? No one was really getting shine. Now they're getting shine and it's great. I love it. But Cecily's been ripping forever. And I would, and because I think the question was, was there anybody? Um, but anyways, she was ripping for so long. I was like, why isn't Cecily getting shine? Like she is ripping with these other these other skaters. I'm like, why isn't she getting shine? Why is she in the mags? Why isn't she getting love? And I think that's just the comment that I wanted to make because I just thought of that because I would watch you skate and I would be thinking like, why isn't she getting the shine? Like, she's ripping. Like, she's killing it. Like, she's up there with everybody, you know? Yeah. And uh, and that's just a question for everybody to think of. And and I'm, you know, I hate to have to say it, but I'm just, I'll say it. Um, there There is no Native American pros in skateboarding. And I do wish that there was. I wish I saw one growing up. I wish I was, like, I saw one in the mag. You know what I'm saying? I wish I saw one in, yeah, right. That would have been fucking ill. So... Yeah. With that, with that, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> That's all. I just wanted to, yeah. to say that. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. I'll Appreciate second all of that. that, especially the Cecily rips. And to add story. to that too, like just what he said about Cecily is like I've always wondered that too because she has good sponsors and she has a really good board sponsor. And it's like, why aren't they turning her pro? So that's just one thing. Like his, he added it to it. So it's like, you know. Might as well just say it, say the same thing too. He's like, you know, she she rips a lot, and I think people should at least really know the fight. Then let's just say it: is the industry Thank racist? Huh? Is the industry racist? Is the skate industry racist? I mean, can we? Yes. I don't know. I, I think the skate industry is racist, and I but I think they don't know it sometimes, because I think essentially skateboarding is really exclusive. Like, if you can't do it, then automatically you're looked down on, like, oh, he's a poser, he can't do what I do. So right away, skateboarding has a built-in exclusivity. Two, I always feel, like, lately I've been thinking about this saying, skateboarding for skateboarders only. Even though that's not racist, it feels racist. It's for skateboarders only, it's for skaters only. And I'm like, and as I think about it, I was like, they're making it sound like if you don't skate, then you're not good as good as them. So there's a second layer of exclusivity. With that kind of exclusivity in the skateboarding industry, which has been there for decades, this is what makes it difficult for guys like Doug and Cecily to make it. Two, I think skateboarding is very extractive. You have brands, you have companies. Look how extractive Adidas and Nike have become 
to your core industry. Look what they did. They came in, cherry-picked everyone, paid them all the money, and pulled it out. And what did they leave? These are corporations. Now, we can't trash talk them. I'm not going to trash talk these big brands. I want to kick it with the big cigar. <laughs> I want to be in Vogue magazine. I want to hang out with Brianna. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to do it too. But these skaters don't do that. They might. You might see us in Vogue. I'm not going to lie. Vogue has reached out to us. But we, these guys deserve it. For 20 years, this 20, 40, 60, 80, 120, that's 140 years of skateboarding experience right here in front of you right now. <laughs> Just like Tommy said, throwing themselves down, getting up, throwing them back self down, building skate parks, stoking out kids, traveling to reservations across the nation. Most of your brands, you don't go to reservations, you go to cool, cool neighborhoods like Costa Mesa. <laughs> oh, we're having a signing. We're going to Costa Mesa. Man, that's the most beautiful town I've ever seen. You're not stoking anybody out. Come to the Reds. Oh, oh, we have a signing. We're going to be in Houston. We're going to be in Dallas. Oh, we have a signing. We're gonna be in West Hollywood. Oh, doing you what? We're gonna make a movie. It's gonna call, we're gonna call it West Hollywood about skateboarding. Yeah, that's cool. I'm not hating on those dudes. I'm saying those dudes are rad. But I'm saying, come on, man. I say, I have this saying, like, because I watched them, right? I, I travel with these guys. I'm kind of like manager, team manager, brand owner. I kind of do it all. I, I buy plane tickets. I pay for hotel rooms, I give per diems, I watch them fall in love, I watch them break up. <laughs> it happens. What, some of you skaters are single? It's okay, you can stay single. Good luck finding a girlfriend that's gonna stick with you. <laughs> but really, I think brown, black, and Native American skaters, we actually have to work twice as hard as a non-native, non-black, non-white, non-Chicano skater slash white. You have to work twice as hard to get the kind of attention that just kind of comes naturally to dudes that are all on enjoy or dudes that are hanging out with, you know, the people on Toy Machine. No diss to these brands, I'm just throwing them out there. They ha these guys are building skate parks. She's out there right now building a skate park. She's gonna build more. Doug is, uh, Doug and Ruben have helped build two skate parks. They're going on a third one in White River. They're on committees. They're in the community. They're advocating for cement parks. We're inviting people all the time. We've invited people all the time to come to the res. Very, very few people will come to the res. I don't know why. Um, props if you've been to the res. And I'm going to give a little bit of props to Ryan. Ryan's been San Carlos. Uh, Ryan, Jaws has been San Carlos. A couple of dudes that are not here, Levi Brown has been to San Carlos. A couple of dudes, Leticia Buffoni has been to San Carlos. She came to San Carlos before she won the big money at the, uh, I think in a big AM contest, like 10, 12 years ago, she was in San Carlos. And she was ripping then. Now she's like a model, but she's still pro, but she was just a crazy kid skating, but I think, I think it is racist. And and I think it hurts itself. I think skateboarding is, is amazing, but it could be out of this world if it could just kind of get over itself. Skateboarding needs to allow people to do what they want, be who they want, skate the way they want, skate where they want, with who they want. It's almost like there's so much gatekeeping in skateboarding. Well, how do I know that? <laughs> it's like, I, you know, I don't have, <laughs> I don't have the vans product manager on speed dial, I got to write to that guy 10 times and maybe I'll hear back from him. Maybe. Maybe I'll hear back from him. You know, I don't have the, you know, high speed distribution manager on speed dial. You know, he was like, oh, I don't know this dude. He's not a bro. He's not a bro. Well, I don't hang out at ASR either. And what happened to ASR? 
because it's so gatekeepy, it it's like I think skateboarding, whoever's in charge, they kind of don't want to open it up because they're like, oh, it's going to become too corporate. It's not going to become corporate. It's going to be this. And if you're scared of this, then you're the problem. <laughs> it's going to become like this because, but we are skateboarding too. What you're looking at is who you are. You're really looking in the mirror. We are you and you are us. We watch the same videos like you. We eat the same snacks. We drink the same crummy PBR. <laughs> we hung out at the same crummy dive bars. We got in the same stupid fights. We woke up in the same throw up. <laughs> that was just a little TMI. Sorry, Trey. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a little TMI there. I don't know how many floors we slept on. I don't know how many couches, floors, but... But we love skateboarding. We love it. We wouldn't be here if we didn't. You know, we're, we're not trying to make a mad grab for money. We're not doing it because it was trendy. We've been doing this for like over 20 years. We weren't trying... I live on a dirt road. If you've been to my house, I live on a dirt road. Doug and his sisters were raised in a single wide trailer. Like a lot of you, I'm sure, grew up that way too. But he asked the question, is skateboarding racist? I would venture to say it is. There's not enough black pros for my, personally. There's not enough Chicano pros. There's not enough Asian pros. One is not enough. There's not even a Native American pro. We could say, oh, there's one, and he's on such and such one. He did a research thing himself. I found two articles, he said. How long has Thrasher even been in existence? Like 45 years? That's like a 0.0001% representation. We're the first Americans, but we're the last when it comes to skateboarding. <laughs> Do you know how many of your brands that we push for you? Do you know how many people follow these guys to see what they wear, what they ride? Do you know in this region how much product these guys help sell? Even Cecily and Jeremy, they buy your stuff and sell it. Even Doug, Ruben, and Trey, they'll rock your brands and all the, what, 10,000, 15,000, 30,000, their algorithm is full of kids that are buying your stuff. Pay these people. Pay your pros, pay your M's. White, black, brown, pay them. Because if you don't pay your skaters, your pros, your M's, that's what opened the door for the Nikes and the Adidas's to come in. That's why those, it's not that those guys were selling out. It's like these core brands weren't paying them. It was some dude like me saying, oh, we don't have to pay them. They're just happy with free stuff. <laughs> these people weren't getting paid. You weren't getting paid. Skaters were not getting paid. That's, why, that's how Nike and Adidas came in and took your industry and it's almost impossible to get it back because they had all the advertising dollars, they had all the flash, they got all the great videographers. I watched it. How do I know this? I'm like you. I look at stuff, I read stuff, I pay attention. And I wondered too, I was like, what happened to audio? What happened to Fallen? What happened to that uh, cool brand Eric Ellington had? It was freaking rad. Now, of course, they're not the best shoes in the world. They're the most skatable, but they were dope. <laughs> like hip hoppers were all over this stuff, and they're poof, gone. Because somebody up there was not paying you down here. I don't know. Call me whatever you want. You know it's true. I don't really have a follow-up to that. Let, um, we're at about an hour in. Are, are we okay with answering questions? Yeah. Let's turn it over to if anybody here has questions they want to ask. And you could ask it, and then I'll repeat it so that it goes on to the record, because it's being recorded. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Agongo. Uh, first of all, thank you all for convening this panel and for speaking with us. Um, also, I would like to greet you in my native language, Nze Patrick Chigongo, Mutabani wa Samuel Moisizi, 
Nidia Inyonyi. Translate for you all who don't speak Luganda, I'm Patrick Kigongo, I'm the son of Sam Kigongo. Um, I'm of the bird clan of the kingdom of Buganda, which is in the country known as Uganda. So the question I have for you on that uh, discussion of the skateboard industry and how it engages or refuses to engage with indigenous people. Uh, Plan B Skateboards very recently released a graphic uh, that was based on uh, indigenous First Nations artwork from uh, a country that's known as Australia. And that particular style of weaving, that particular style of artwork in its presentation is to only be done by those, uh, those master creatives who have learned that task, who have learned that craft that has been passed on to them since time immemorial. And very similar to how there are totems, symbols, articles of clothing, things like that, that are not to be photographed or to be shared out you know, within my background, from you know, my family. Very similar for those First Nations people in Australia. I grew up in the 1990s skateboarding. CCS was filled with controversial, edgy, and in some cases just straight up racist and you know, difficult graphics. And that was something at the time which was presented as part of the culture. We're now in a space where some of us know a little bit better, but within the skateboard industry, the immediate pushback that you might get is, it's a free country, I can you know, use whatever I want, use whatever graphic I want, you know, and, and why does it have to be that person? Like, this, it looks cool. You know, this, you know, this came from my, you know, this came from my inspirational, from my inspiration whiteboard. How do you have that conversation about the appropriation of, of indigenous art, of native graphics? I'm just going to repeat, I can't repeat all of that, obviously. <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, it's about representation of indigenous art, of things that culturally might be sacred even. Um, how do we have that conversation about appropriation, um, about the artwork and the things that are depicted? I mean, like, there are lots of guilty brands. Um, Zero did those cheesy Indian skull heads with the headdresses and Plan B. Um, uh, Santa Cruz has done, you know, kind of generic. This is the stuff that Doug was referring to, sort of generic Indian, uh, native generican, as he would call it. Um, so how do we address that issue, and how do we, maybe even how do we make traction? How do we make more traction? Any thoughts on that? I think it's, I think it's just, a, I think oh, probably one of the most important ways is to do what we're doing right now. Uh, to open your doors, invite uh, people like ourselves, of course, uh, that know and understand the culture and that are coming from the culture. It's not that hard. It's not that hard to write to Doug Jr. and say, hey, uh, we want to come to White River. Can you help us? It's not that hard to write to Ruben and say, hey, we'd like to come to Gila River. Could, would you like to help us? It's not that hard to write to me and say, hey, oh, oh, so for example, like yesterday, uh, the Phoenix Suns reached out to me and they said, would you like to do a graphic? And I said, yeah, and then they, um, no diss to the Phoenix Suns, but uh, in the end I didn't do it. Not, not because it wasn't cool, it's just that I didn't move fast enough. But at least they reached out to me. And so um, I'll do something with them later, but doing what we're doing right now, you know, if you have a platform, you know, it's important to use it. And it's important to share it. And if you have that kind of privilege too and that kind of platform you know we're not you don't have to be threatened by us we're we're skaters too we are skateboarding too we want people to get stoked out on what you have too you know if you put uh if you make doug pro uh, for real or if you make him pro for a uh, birdhouse if you put him pro he's just gonna make you look better he's gonna make your brand look woke even though woke is a bad word, but it's not a bad word. It's a good word. But he'll make your brand um, really represent America, the way America is really made and shaped. But you don't have to be afraid of Native American people. And you don't have to really hold us up here, too, like we're some great spiritual beings, uh, you know, like that we have eagle wings sprouting out of our back all the time or something. <laughs> some of these guys do, though, if you watch the way they skate. You would think the spirit of the ego has, has <laughs> absorbed them. <laughs> you know, just like if you would think it by looking at them because they're so dang good. But in, really, though, I'm just teasing. 
but really like they could say that too they could come up with all this native american stuff and like bedazzle everyone because that's what everybody wants to hear they want to hear like the native american story but we don't really have any <laughs> like he's over here saying like he was either going to skate or go get drunk and he didn't want to get drunk that's the that's the worst story i've heard all day but it's kind of it's true and so all i'm saying is uh it's good to reach out uh to us you know it's not hard to do a little research like what he did and i'm not trying to hog the question either What he said is pretty good about having a, using your platform to bring awareness. That's, that's what I agree on. I think also m my thought on that is that um, collabs are, can be good, but they can also just be like box checking. You know, we did it. Our company's cool. We hired a native artist one time to do one board. That's not enough. I mean, that's almost as bad as just taking the weaving from a Australian Aboriginal tribe and putting it on a board and then just kind of that's it right okay so you paid somebody once to do one thing like that that's not that's not building relationships that's not actually like um, paying people who deserve to get paid for their artwork that's not using your platform well um, it's extractive in the end I think any other questions yeah Yeah. I, saw, I remember that article with the, the band member of uh, Pro Jam yeah. that did the skate parks at the reservations. And I was wondering, the, the uh, Bright Chapel didn't come out? The board slide down? Because I would have said that would have been the point zero zero zero. On the, the recent one, yeah, right? Bright so, but it, yeah. but I don't yeah. think, I no, think, I mean that Brian Chapo is in there, yes, but. I think that was only like based around Instagram. They didn't really yeah. put it, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was like the SLS kind of. It was all over SLS, and right. it was mostly only based on Instagram. Yeah. Would you he know that he was... <laughs> Twice. One, back in the day for Goodwood, he did an ad um, at El Toro. Salad. Okay. Yeah. Salad down El Toro. Yeah. But he's not pro for any big companies. Right. Yeah. But he's, am he's amazing, too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's killer. Yeah, that was MVD on that. Yeah. But that's the rail, and is it modus operandi where the guy grinds it, and you have the voiceover yeah, from the call that's like, you know, not putting the names on there? What are you doing? <laughs> Drives me crazy. It's that same rail, and he boards it. It's in Denver, right? S -S crazy. Yeah, yeah. No, but I, he, okay, so native people, sometimes you'll see them in there. Very little. They'll be sprinkled in, but they're not, it's not acknowledged in any way, or it's, there's nothing, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't, yeah. Uh, any, do we have other questions? Sure. Um, so, like, growing up, and I've been skating, like, 30 years, you know, since I was a little, little kid. I grew up in, like, East Bakersfield. Bakersfield's still racially divided to this day. I grew up on the east side, which is all Mexican. I'm very, like, white-looking. I'm, I'm half Welsh, Jewish. Um, but, yeah, is there... Because what I've seen is... Because it was so gatekeepy and and so, you know, we're, we're the guys that are good, you know, we box you out, whatever, like growing up, that that's really affected my progression and things like that. And I didn't really like, until very recently, I had a very life-changing experience, uh, kind of opened myself up to like, yeah, I am good. I'm a good skater, man. Like, I'm finally like proud of it and stuff. And it took a long time to like battle that. Do you guys feel that because skating is getting bigger, like, are there any things that you feel are good with it getting bigger and, like, bad? Because, like, from what I've noticed, it's, like, way back in the days, like, especially, like, Bakersfield and stuff like that, I'd bomb a hill, like, every day to my friend Moy's house. Like, I lived on top of, like, Fairfax Street. My parents still live there. Uh, just bombing the hill, dodging cholos and pit bulls and stuff <laughs> to basically, like... Yeah get to Moyes and watch like Subject to Change and stuff like that. Uh, but back then, everybody would like fight for each other. Like you saw another kid on a board, it didn't matter like skin color or anything like that. We didn't care about that. You saw some 20 year old cholo dude like trying to punk out some like 12 year old for his board. Everyone would run over there and like heckle him until he'd be just 
oh, whatever, you know, and you take your stuff and you're like, ha you know, because that was like the worst thing growing up was, hey, kid, let me see your board. That was the worst thing to hear, you know, because you were like, oh, my God, I'm going to get punked or jumped. But, like, I, I've i seen, like, to me, that there's not that as much closeness, but there's a lot of, like, like people embracing the, uh, the differences and stuff. But, like, is there anything that you guys have noticed that's, like, good with skateboarding becoming really big and bad with skateboarding becoming bigger? I guess is my main thing is, like, some good and bads that you guys see. Like, is there anything like that? I think I see a lot of good things with skateboarding. Just like like you said, a lot of people being there for one another. And, like, when people meet up at the skate park, it doesn't matter who you are, race or female male doesn't matter and I think it's changing for the better and everyone's coming more together because back in the day when I hear like stories about because I grew up on the res I wasn't around a lot of skate people until I moved to Gallup so I used to hear stories about people saying like, oh you're a poser like just saying like you can't land that like just being like mean to each other but nowadays it seems like there's a lot of support and everyone's just like cheering for one another and it's right. I almost I, never hear the yeah. word yeah it's crazy it's like, almost extinct yeah. yeah it's going extinct it's because yeah. five-year-olds are way better than i am like, yeah. it's, 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 it's like, i watch instagram is both inspirational and totally dispiriting it's like, oh, man. and it's just crazy to see like just skating for so long and just see like how how far skateboarding has come and like within like 20 to 15 years it's come so like come a long ways and now it's like it's so accepted. It's like it's cooler than football. It's cooler than basketball. It's like it's the sickest thing ever. Then like when we first started, like it was, you know, barely cool. Like it was barely accepted. But nowadays, like we like we're it's very accepted. And like just like he said, like if someone messes with somebody that's an outsider and like, you know, everyone Scott, like if you're a skater, we all got each other's backs. That's for sure. Uh, the good thing is, you know, it brings us all together as skaters, like in this room, you know, and this wouldn't be possible without the, the skate progression going. But the bad thing is we got to come up here and explain who we are and ourselves and why we don't have a platform in right. the industry. I mean, do you guys feel that there's a, uh, that there's something we can do to make a certain platform to get representation of everyone? Like maybe a certain, like, make a magazine or something that could connect everything because like I said I mean and like yeah. you guys have said there's so many you know nations of different indigenous people and you know people of Uganda and stuff like that it's like you know yeah just to include us in in, in mainstream skateboarding media in the mainstream right because we can create our own stuff which we already have and we already been doing and that's fine like I I'm not up here to play like I don't want to be a victim and, and try to come off as a victim either because I'm going to do what the fuck I want. I'm going to make some fucking skateboards and I'm going to make my own content. I'm going to make my own media and, and do do it myself. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, like, keep com complaining, I guess. You know what I'm saying? If you don't want to do it, then we're going to do it. And it's it's coming out sick. Like, they got their own, like, everybody here is, is doing that. And it's sick. Like, we got the kids and, like, there's a whole community behind it now. Um, it's it's a revolution happening in Native American country right now. And it was started by him. It was started by this guy right here. And everything in Native American country, it's happening. It's popping off, right? It's popping off. He inspired it. I was there to see it. They were there. They were along. They were doing it too. So I think just include us, man. Just include us in the mainstream. It, like come on like it's not right. it's it's not that hard to be honest when i think about it that's why i trip on it like why <laughs> you guys ever feel that sometimes it's because like certain parts of like california and stuff like that influences so much of skateboarding culture that like maybe it's from people not reaching out to them and, and planting that seed and being where they're at because maybe they're lazy or they don't want to go out of their way yeah, because everyone wants you to go to Cali, right? Someone could walk up to me right now and say, well, why don't you just go to fucking Cali then? Like, go over there. Go move over there. Go go make it happen. I'm like, dude, I want to live on the res and stay with my people and help my people and my community. 
Like, I don't need to go to California. I think I, I can't speak for all of them, but when I created the phrase "you're skating on native land," I wanted also it's like a it's like a loaded question, right? It's like a loaded phrase, but it's kind of like saying, and it's hard to say this, but native people we think differently than non-native people. We just think differently about everything. Uh, of course, when we love something, we love it too. Like skateboarding, we all love it, but native people are. Are, are always going to be tied to a place like land. We're always going to be tied to home. We're always going to be tied to our, the lands of our nativity. And so it was a reminder to Native people when I created that phrase, but it was also a reminder to non-Natives that you know, this is what we're doing and this is where we do it at. And when, when I think about land as a Native person, I think about, like you said, while you're in the city, you're on the asphalt, you're in the cement. And yes, that's modern society, but even before the asphalt and cement, like he said, we are here bleeding and living and dying on this land. So the land is really soaked up with our blood. It's soaked up with our blood. So, and, and blood will speak. Blood kind of speaks out from the ground up. That's, but also when you look at, like, when I look at, like, a, a picture of a skater, they always, what do they always show? Like, what's the raddest thing to show is, like, his face is full of what? It's blood. Oh, he, it's like the greatest thing you could do is, like, almost kill yourself on a skateboard and still survive. <laughs> it's, it's the blood. It's the blood that, that all of us shed that really makes this land sacred. But we're here first. Native people were here first. And so this is what makes us in this land sacred. That's what I meant. I think for these guys skating, I think they're just, you know, there's a lot, I, like, uh, what's his name? Like, he just says so many great things about it. I can't think of his name right now, but he's like a skate philosopher. I can't think of his name, but he'll just go on and on. But he would probably have a lot more to say about it. But. Uh, Rodney Mullen would probably have a lot more to say about this, but really, I think I think everything that these guys are doing, but I think everything that you guys are doing is amazingly beautiful and sacred in its own way. And I think because it's sacred and because it's beautiful and because it's hard, everybody can't skate. It's hard. And I think because it's already hard, there's no need for it to, to be even more gatekeepy. If you could do it, that's the gatekeep. There's no need to tell people, oh, you can't come in. That's, it's already hard. Don't make it harder for, for people. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go ahead, you have a question. Sorry, Myself, not from America, so I just wanted to see if you 
I've seen, I've seen a lot, of, a lot online about the Uganda Skate Society. I'm seeing yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a lot about Uganda. I'm seeing a lot about the girls from the Mayan girls. From, I can't. I think they're from Colombia. I'm seeing a lot about them. I'm seeing a lot about them in media. Um, skate a stand. Of course, we're hearing about the kids that skate in Afghanistan, which is uh, sad because now that company is uh, that brand or that country. That country is now like kind of off on its own, so we don't know what's happening to the Afghanistani kids. But we're, s we're seeing a lot of that, um, you know. Um, and, I, and I agree with Doug. What Doug said, like we don't, we're not the victims. We don't want to. We're not trying to play a victim card here. It's just like he said. Everyone here is doing what we're doing. We're doing it in spite of uh, who's noticing or who doesn't notice. Uh, but that doesn't mean like we're trying to, you know. We're trying to be number one or nothing like that. We're just working our butts off. And that's why a guy from NPR, he emailed me one day. He goes, hey, I saw on your Twitter you said uh, Apache Skateboards is the hardest working skate brand in America. Why did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, it's true. These, these, all of these people up here, they're working nonstop. They're hosting events. They're judging events, they're planning skate comps, they're planning skate parks as we speak. Shoot, we took like a, I don't know if some of you have traveled in a skate van, but we took like, what was it, like a 30 hour skate trip on the road to Oklahoma just like three months ago. And then we got there, we did the event, and then Doug turned to me and says, we should go home now. <laughs> I said, dude, I need to sleep. I just need, he said, okay, we'll sleep one night and then we'll go. I was in a van with these guys for 30 hours, you know? So it's like, they are really working hard, and that's why I said it, you know? Um, and uh, I, I, props to all the other pro teams out there, but I think that uh, skaters like this, uh, and even skaters like Ryan, they are the skate pro of the future. Because the skate pro of the future, as brands get bigger, your brands, if you have a brand, it's going to get bigger. Why? Because the world is growing. The population is growing. So more kids are wanting to skate, and that's good. But my point is, as it grows, uh, the skater of the future is going to be doing these things. The skater, of, uh, the skater that's just going to kick it and just wait for their team manager to call them, and he's going to say, OK, he's going to put the bong down. OK, I guess I got to go to Brooklyn. <laughs> Okay, I guess I gotta get some tricks for my sponsors. That guy's gonna be out the door. It's gonna be this type of skater in the future that's uh, doing farming or teaching kids to plant their own food or teaching kids to you know get close to uh, be out in nature or build these skate parks or teaching kids how to sh how to film and how to shoot. You know how to photograph. You know how to design footwear. There's some stuff that still I feel like in skateboarding is it's so secretive. We can't tell them how we do it. You know we can't tell them how many boards they sold. <laughs> we can't give them. A, we can't tell them what the real percentage is. We can't tell them we're buying these boards in China for a dollar a piece. <laughs> we can't tell them that. You know, we're selling for sixty bucks. I mean, I don't know what's going on back there. I don't know. Yeah, I own a brand, but not like that. <laughs> but we don't know what's going on. That's what I'm saying. That's why we're here. We're like, what the heck's going on? You know, we're, you know, we're just like you. But it's like, uh, but we don't want people to say, oh, they're the Indian guys. Let them do the Indian thing. No, no, because we're buying your stuff. We're buying your shoes. We're buying your jackets and your hoodies and your beanies. We're buying all that stuff from you. We are your customer. And if we don't get customer service, guess what? We're going to talk about it. <laughs> We're going to talk about it. We buy your product. We help your kids go to school because we're buying it from you. But it's dope. You got, what, everything you're making is dope. I don't see anybody here that's not wearing a dope pair of shoes. So, and we love it. We love it. I'm not, I'm not against Nike. A dunk is, a, a dope design is a dope design. Dunks, it's gonna be dope forever. It's gonna be dope forever, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I think that's a good, oh, do you want? One last question, one then last we can end it. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you guys talked about like, a wide range of stories, and it's interesting to like, 
what people want to tell for you versus like your own stories like if nike or adidas did come to you with money and creative direction like do you want to tell the traditional story do you want to tell maybe the hard story of alcohol versus skating like what is the story you would want to tell given a platform or money or creative vision that new shit like we don't want to go and tell that old you know everybody everybody wants that but we these people are creatives these people are innovative these people are on the cutting edge of whatever is going on in skateboarding we want to tell that skateboarding it has it's been the same and i love it i love it i still watch it and i still consume all the content but it's been the same forever right it's skateboard tricks music that's it now there's a lot of room to change and working with anybody here you will get that um i think and it's important to tell other stories besides alcoholism it's important to tell other stories besides poverty besides um uh, uh stuff like that because you don't want to put you don't, skateboarding doesn't want and this is kind of like where people are kind of afraid of i feel like is you don't want to make our narrative about alcohol all about alcoholism all about charity and these guys are a charity case and all of these kids are just you know dirt poor because we don't want that you know what i'm saying we want do the cool shit like all you got to do is take go skate with ty for a day shoot a couple photos that shit is innovative like look at a couple photos go skate with trey go hang out with him design something with him that shit's gonna sell you know what i'm saying that shit's gonna sell um kick it with you know anybody pick anybody here you can do that. I think that's the story that needs to be told. Those are the images that need to be put out. Um, yeah. All right. I want to thank everybody for being here today. Um, this has been a, a great conversation. Can I hear one last round of applause for the panelists? And just to follow their Instagrams, you know, do follow, find them on social media, support their their businesses and their companies and their shops and everything that they're doing um, because they deserve it. And uh, Doug has mentioned that they, he has he wants to do a product toss. So let's uh, let's do this. It's a product class. It's a product class. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What's that? I want it to. Shibaris. Oh, God. Thank you, beautiful people. Thank you for coming out. What?